Bavrock Kajar in Belgium, one of the world's most challenging racetracks in what might be challenging conditions, ready for qualifying to begin for round three of the FIA World Endurance Championship. Not just round three of the series, but also the final shakedown before the centenary Le Mans 24 hours. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our coverage. After mixed conditions in free practice, the track is relatively dry. About an hour ago, there was a little sprinkle of rain here at turn one and in the pit lane and down towards Eau Rouge. But other than that, it should be dry for qualifying, which will come in three groups, our GT cars, then our LMP2s, and then our hypercars. I'm Martin Haven, alongside me in the booth, Graham Goodwin and Anthony Davidson. In the pit lane is Louise Beckett. We'll start with you, Anthony. Final preparations for qualifying. Only one driver now goes out and does qualifying. So that means there's an awful lot of load on one person's shoulders. Yeah, there certainly is, Martin. Uh, you've got two, effective two drivers uh, on holiday, uh, especially if you're <laughs> driving in third, uh, third stint in the race. Uh, it's a nice, easy time, but for the drivers that are stepping into qualifying, the pressure's on you. And uh, here's Ben Keating in the Corvette. Um, uh, he'll fe be feeling a lot of pressure. So the bronze drivers, the category of uh, bronze drivers, have to qualify in the GT category. So here is the Sarah Bovey show and Ben Keating show. They've been at it for all the races so far in the World Endurance Championship. I'm convinced it's going to be the same thing here in Spa yet again. Well, remember as well, Ben's had his uh, his home race at Sebring. This is Sarah Bovey's home race. She knows this Ooh. track really well. I will disagree, by the way, with something Martin Haven said. That wasn't a sprinkle. That was heavy enough that I couldn't leave, unfortunately, the Ferrari hospitality while I was enjoying a coffee. It was awful. I had to I, stay there for a good 10 or 50. It, it I absolutely steroided it down. We're seeing the 83 car. That was a car that had real problems at Sebring. And then this brand new car introduced last time I had brought him out. We also, a little earlier in the broadcast, saw the 21 car, which we will not be seeing in this session, and we'll talk about that uh, once we've had a quick look around this fabulous Spa-Francorchamps circuit. Yeah, that was the car we saw in the garage, of course, there, Graham, wasn't it? Still getting rebuilt, but yeah, round three here at Spa-Francorchamps, a brilliant, picturesque circuit, one of the driver's favourites, myself included, always loved coming here. Seven kilometres long, 4.5 miles long, 4.3 miles long, I should say. Yeah, you can see the ambient weather there. 18 degrees, 25 degrees track temp, 53 degrees humidity. And as always in Spa, that is the uh, name of the game. Watch out for the weather. Well, there's a view of the big new grandstand that was opened last year up at Eau Rouge. It gives you a great view of the track as the cars break out of Blanchimont down towards the bus stop. You can follow them all the way round the hairpin and then down through Eau Rouge. It is a massive challenge for the cars and even more so for the drivers. So here we are then. Like we said, it was seven kilometers, 4.3 miles long. A great circuit with a lot of undulation, elevation change around 100 meters throughout the lap. We focus on turn one here at the source. It's the pit lane exit as well. A good overtaking spot, but a corner you need to master in qualifying as well, particularly on the brakes on those cold tires. Then next up, we look at Eau Rouge and Radion. Turn three, four, takes you up the hill. A real tricky complex in sports cars to get right. It's definitely the corner it's cracked up to be. And then finally down at the chicane, another great overtaking spot and an important one to nail in qualifying again on the brakes. That right-left combination. You attack the curbs pretty heavily there in 19 and 20. You've got the pit lane entry as well. Quite a, a, a tricky pit lane entry to navigate during the race with the walls very close. We've seen a few mistakes there in the past, but um, yeah getting ready for, for qualifying here. So last time out actually around this track for Toyota, you know, just some lap times for you to, to, to look at. It was a two minute three lap time for Toyota. It was pole position for the Glickenhaus, however, with a 201, uh, sorry, a 202.7. And this morning, uh, so yesterday in FP2, we had a, the fastest time uh, from the Ferrari of uh, Giovinazzi with a 201, already faster than last year's pole position time. As the cars come out onto the apron, a quick couple of looks there at these two new grandstands. One new last year, another brand new one inaugurated just yesterday evening. And 
some of the best views in motorsport anywhere in the world. The new grandstand up at Radion opened for last year's race. The new uh, endurance grandstand opposite the old pits opened yesterday evening. Full view from La Source up to the apex of Radion. And if you are somewhere in the Low Countries or northwestern Germany, pop out for some milk tomorrow and get over here because there is uh, a great race in prospect tomorrow, Saturday morning. Grandstands will be available. You can buy tickets. It and is going to be busy. Yeah, yeah. You, you go back with a pint of milk, you know, 7 o'clock tomorrow night, you'll be fine. Yeah, there will be nothing. And if you've got any spare milk, by the way, can you just drop it off our uh, yes. production studio? Because yes. there's no milk in <laughs> no there. Milk I can't there. Make, I haven't had go. a proper cup of tea since I left the UK. Storylines galore in this uh, 14 car. Mm -hmm. GTE Amp Group. There'll be 13 of those 14 out. We'll talk about the 21 car a little later in the show. The car we just saw, the, the 88, uh, didn't race, of course, at Sebring after an incident with one of the hypercars in practice. Comes here on the back of a win for that car as the number 16 in the European Le Mans Series last weekend. A switch of pro drivers uh, in the number 88 car from Alessio Picariello uh, last weekend. But uh, the 77 car here, one of the most storied entries in the whole of the FI World Endurance Championship and includes, of course, Mr. Always Present, Christian Reed, the team principal of uh, Dempsey Proton Racing Proton Competition, has contested every single FIWC race since the series inception 2012. 83 car, which was in the gravel traps down at the Jackie Ick chicane in the first, uh, in FP3 this afternoon, or this morning rather, and the 21 car, well, Diego Lessi crashed that really heavily yeah. into the not car he, of Thomas Floor. Not that one he did, that is a brand new, a chassis, brand new chassis for the team being built up, that car yeah. we will see tomorrow, in last uh, at Portimao we saw the 110th uh, Lego Peugeot, this is an altogether different kit. Now, Graham, because they... But yeah, this is what happened, actually. At the top of Eau Rouge and Radion, you had the slower car of the 54 on an outlap. Obviously, no tyre blankets anymore yep. in the World Endurance Championship. So a slower car, the white flag was being waved. Was. Therefore, slow vehicle on track. Correct. The driver should have known that and didn't respect the flag and ended up hitting his teammate he at did. very high speed. That was a, a, ver that was a slow mo uh, shot, of course, but it would happen at very high speed at the top of Eau Rouge there and um, did a more damage uh, to the car that, uh, yeah, did the misdemeanor. Yeah, the, but, 20, um, the 21 car, which, by the way, if you're a uh, regular watchers of the FR World Endurance Championship, the 21 car you saw in that footage, not the one in the garage, that is the 51 car that won the World Championship two years ago. The 51 car that won the World Championship last year is the car that ended up upside down uh, at Turn 1 at Sebring. Oh, is that so, right? So okay. it's not oh. been great for the provenance of World Championship <laughs> Ferraris over the last couple Ferrari's of years. Ferrari's GTE history has been <laughs> rolled into oblivion, basically, <laughs> single-handedly by one crew. Well, let's hear from the Corvette team. This is Ben Keating getting ready to head out to a track where he was on pole last season. Reminder before we go out, Ben, uh, you can use the button but use it when you feel like you're about to push. Copy that. I will uh, not use it for the first two laps and uh, engage it on the third. The button. Yeah, that's the big red button that says do Don't, not do press. Do not press this button. The button. <laughs> the button. That's what everybody want to know now. What is the button? I reckon it might be engine timing. Maybe so. Yeah. Just to give that a little bit extra power. I mean, we used to do things in uh, LMP2 as well, like turn off the air conditioning yep. for, for the lap when it's you needed it. Yeah. Just to give you that little bit of extra power. Um, and you had to be careful because the cockpit temperature is controlled yep. in the World Endurance Championship. You can't go, I think it's over seven degrees above ambient. ambient. Above ambient. Yep. So you, you have to be careful when you turn that off. But uh, maybe it's the button is, is something to do with either of those. Little story around the first car out, that matte blue Aston Martin, the 98 Northwest AMR. Very different Ten, livery for regular nine, viewers. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. LMGT qualifying session has started. And in fact, very different livery if you're not a regular viewer. So the very different livery, because it is now run for Heart of Racing. Right. So Paul Dallalana, who has been Northwest AMR, who's been part of the championship almost as long as Christian Reed, the single most successful driver in GTE Am in terms of wins, podiums and, and strings and all sorts of records, has finally come to the point where 
business has to take over and he's had to basically step away from racing. So the Northwest AMR is still the name of the team, but it's a trio, a different trio of drivers for, from the heart of racing. And it will be the USA's Ian James, who's their bronze driver, their gentleman driver, who goes out to qualify. Now, in FP3, those of you that were listening and paying attention and taking notes, I did say a couple of times Sarah Bovey was on pole here last year. She was not. It was Ben Keating was on pole here. But as we said, from the end of last, second half of last year, and all through this year so far, every qualifying session, despite what free practice might have warned us to expect, has seen Ben Keating versus Sara Bovey as the battle for pole. We have had, though, last time out, uh, it got a lot closer. We said we thought last time out the Ferraris would be closer. It proved to be the case, but came down to that battle. Let's see who's out there at the moment in these cars. It is the bronze drivers that will take the wheel in this 15-minute session, already down under 14 minutes. The ORT by TF, that's uh, the Oman Racing Team by TF, the 25 Aston Martin in the hands of Armand Harty already this year a pole position man but in LMP2 in the Asia Le Mans series Ben Keating not said about Ben uh, the bronze Jesus is known as on the internet and there's every reason to expect why <laughs> the, the bronze Jesus yes, or indeed. Jesus uh, Jesus um, it is in the number 33 Corvette racing car the 54 AF Corsa Ferrari the other car involved in that shunt uh, yesterday evening in the hands of Thomas Fleur what a magnificent job the AF Corsa guys have done to put that car back together as well PJ Hyatt makes his uh, return after missing Portimao with a clash with the MC WeatherTech Sports Car Championship in the Project 1 AO Racing 56 car 57's Kessel Racing. Uh, that's uh, it's the bright yellow Ferrari in the hands of Takeshi Kimura. Claudio Scavoni in the other bright yellow car, Iron Links number 60, and that's one of the Porsches. 77 Dempsey Proton Racing in the hands of Christian Reed. Lewis Perez Compact is in the 83 Richard Beale AF Corsa Ferrari. Iron Dames, we can see the bright pink. Uh, hugely popular Iron Dames uh, Porsche is in the hands of, as we've said, Sarah Bovey, the Belgian lady driver. Mike Wainwright is aboard his 86 GR racing Porsche. Proton Competitions 88 in the hands of the American driver Ryan Hardwick. Ian James, uh, British by heritage, America by adoption, and he's in the Northwest AMR 98. And finally, it's the 777 D Station Racing uh, uh, Aston Martin in the hands of Satoshi Hoshino. Speaking of. Uh Hoshino and the Aston Martins, they've had a little bit of a, a boost for, for this race uh, in regards to the BOP, so a little bit of boost, pre literally boost pressure, um, a little bit of a tickle there to, to try and just boost their performance, They're lacking a little bit, they felt, uh, the ACO and the FIA for the first two rounds of the championship, it was a lock-up already, the car 56 into uh, La Source there, and uh, this relatively new gravel trap still on the exit of that corner means that you can't just carry on at full racing speed back onto the circuit anymore. You have to respect the edge of the track. We've talked about those changes, haven't we, here at Spa for the spectator facilities. There's been a lot of subtle and some unsubtle changes, most of which is around, as you see one of them here, changes to accommodate international motorcycle racing. Uh, the, uh, uh, as, as we move forward. And we, we said in the FP3 show, which uh, again, here and every race for, further forward, free and live on YouTube, um, that, that is the motorcycle cutout at Jackie X Corner. And you were uh, putting the, uh, the challenge, which driver might, or rider might that be named after? Yeah. And Stephen Gate tells me, well, it's Jackie X because he was a Belgian national motorcycle champion before. Was he? He, yes, he See, was. You learn something every day. The there double Jackie X corner. The double Jackie X. He's got X. two corners, and rightly so as well. It was a, for a long time a corner with no name. I always used to call it Turn 9. I think I will carry on calling it Turn 9 because it's just ingrained into me from listening to engineers on their laptops for too many years. But as we run on board now with Ben Keating, he's getting his tyres up to speed. Now, we're not going to focus too much much on the first couple of lap times that they do because we heard from the man himself saying I'm only going to press the button the after button. the third lap that's when he feels that the tyres will be in yep this is remember the final time that we will see here at Spa the GTE spec of uh GT machinery uh, in the FI World Insurance Championship. Not quite the final time at Spa because, of course, this is the only other track, the only track we're going to see them again with the European Le Mans series uh, later this year on their farewell tour before LMGT3 comes into use in 2024. Keating apparently has just been told to use the button.
So uh, the team obviously feeling that the tyres are coming into uh, up to temperature faster than predicted. And that's something this circuit's always been able to do. You know, high speed corners here, puts a lot of energy through the, the side of the tyre. And it's a bit like a, a squash ball, you know, you keep flexing it, hitting against the wall, squashing it around. It heats up from inside. And, uh, and that's what gives you ultimately the grip you need. Yeah, young Lido Wadu watches as this Paris Compact comes through to start the flying lap. It's 2.22.028 is the marker so far for Ben Keating, but already through se uh, sector one with another purple sector, it is already 1.3 seconds up on that uh, schedule. So cracking stuff already from Ben Keating. 2.17.4 was Keating's pole time last okay. year. In still to come. Yeah. But here, that was in not a Corvette, that was in the Aston Martin. Here comes the most likely driver to depose him from that record. Sarah Bovey will want to do well here for herself, for the team, for the Belgian fans. Um, was down in the pit lane for a very well attended uh, driver autograph session earlier. And it's fair to say, with all the glittering array of hypercars we've got here, some of the biggest queues reserved for this crew um, and the 85 Iron Dames. Already race winners in the European Le Mans series and knocking on the door of race winning success at the World Championship level. And desperately need merch. They need, <laughs> there will be more yes. pink in the grandstands next year than there will be red for Ferrari if they get their merchandise and gear in, in organisation. And keep it going quickly here, yep. but quicker still right now is Ahmed Al Harty, second quickest overall, way off and not a representative time, but on a very good split at the moment. Better though by Ben Keating in sector two. And PJ Hyatt in the AO Porsche that we saw locking up at La Source. Is this his first time here ever racing, I think? Uh, I think you might be right. And did a couple of one offs in the. Can't have a couple of one offs, great. Very uh, good sector one. In the Michelin Le Mans Cup, but I don't think he's raced here before. Keating keeps it clean on the exit of the final corner. I'm not sure it's going to be enough, though, because our hearty further down on the lap behind him is just coming into the chicane now, so Keating's probably happy with that lap, but I think he's about to get superseded as... Uh Al Harty's making his way through that final chicane right now as we watch the slow-mo yeah. of Keating. I'm, I'm looking for the lap times. Here we go. It's going to be a second up or so. Goes to the top. It's a 2.18, wow. 1.27 for the Aston Martin. Three seconds quicker. He will be very happy with that, the Amani driver. Very quick, bronze level driver, I said. Uh, made a late, he was a late addition in LMP2 for two races of the Asia Le Mans series uh, in February and put the car on pole. In, at uh, Yas Marina in both of his first two goes in another B2 car. Hey, it improves the fastest final sector, but not enough to uh, topple our hearty off That's a great lap from a driver who wasn't in Portimao two weeks ago, so hasn't raced a car since Sebring, and his first time in Spa. That's a great lap from PJ Hyatt. Yep. Sarah Bovey is struggling here. Yes, she is. 1.5 seconds away. And actually aborts that lap yep. to make sure. So you take a wider line through the... Oh, oh no, big trouble. There. Big trouble. It's PJ Hyatt. So that looks... Is that Radion? Yeah, that's the, the exit. Of, yeah, yeah it There's is. There's a red, red flag, flag immediately. immediately. Yeah, that's yeah, the exit of, of Radion. Radion. So he has got squirrely through Eau Rouge and... If we get a, a replay of that, it will be the car coming backwards over the brow. And after just Take setting, yeah, here we go. Straight oh, barrier good. there. A lot of energy going into that tyre barrier. That's a lot of mechanics that won't get any sleep tonight. There you go, over the brow backwards. Lost it, and as you see the driver looking already in trouble, looking to where, see where the barrier is. It's coming up at you very quickly. Luckily, the car had enough rotation in it. It's just dispersed a lot of the energy, and at this point, you're bracing yourself. Yeah. That's the, the Gerhard Berger moment. Feet yeah. off the pedals, hands off the steering wheel, roll yourself into as small a ball as you can. Saw, as he came over the crest, the energy going through that car, the rear right tyre off the ground uh, really was lucky. That car stayed on all four wheels. Like I said, Eau Rouge for sports cars, it suddenly becomes the corner it's cracked up to be. We yeah. hear a lot of hype about Eau Rouge, and actually in, in most categories of cars that race around here nowadays, they've outgrown that series of corners yeah. and it's easily flat out for them. It's like, it's a, it just interrupts your lovely straight line that you're in. It's an inconvenience to your lap. We, but in sports cars, no matter which category you're in, you, it grabs your attention.
where he's moving in the cockpit, yes, which is indeed. all that anybody cares about right now, because the uh, the impact lights will have come on. There's a blue light in the front of the screen. The medical crew are there, but he's moving. We saw him moving before impact. He's got the door open. OK, do not get out of the car. Wait for the doctor to assess you. What hurts? How are you? Da, da, da. It's no, more the shock I'm than fine. anything. Yes. When you have yeah. a, a big crash like that, especially in radio, and it's, it's the shock that yeah. you have to get rid of. The, the adrenaline so high in your body. Um, but yeah, he, he'll, he'll be fine. There's the Project One garage. They know there's a lot of work to do on that car. Doesn't look any nicer the second or third time you see it, does it? Never gets oh, better. That was the reaction from Royal Right. Everybody yep. knows it, it. Everybody knows it could be them. Yep. You know, Rouge. You know, it's, it's a risk reward thing. Yeah, the crowd cheer. And, you know, he's out of the car. Okay, but um, now you know it, it puts the fear, more fear, into all of the drivers sitting mm. in the cockpits now, thinking, yeah, that looked like a big one, and I've got to get back out there and carry on qualifying now. Can I just point out why aren't you lot at work? <laughs> it's a Friday. It's, Friday. it's not a Saturday. I mean, yep. this is so encouraging for the future of this sport. We're coming back here. It was announced yesterday for another five seasons after this through to 2028 with the World Endurance Championship. And wherever you are in the UK, in Northern Europe, this is a, a stunning track to come to and so easy to get to. And your entrance ticket gets you the everywhere. Autograph session everywhere. into the paddock, pit walk, everything. I mean, it's 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 an ast astonishing thing. We're, we can become blase. That wheel was off the ground and well yeah. off the ground. Can become blase when you bump into fans and talk to them about their experience. Genuinely, people who've been to other forms of motorsport cannot believe the access they get to teams and drivers of absolute world class. You can see everything in this crash doing its job the way it's yep. supposed to be. It's this grade one FIA circuit in that in terms of safety and a lot of calculations this this doesn't happen by chance no. uh, the way that he's been able to walk out of this car the FIA are completely on it in terms of how they've shifted barriers around at the top of Radion and how they govern the safety of all the cars as well and so we don't know how this is going to go if they allow us to go back out we can put another set of stickers on we are plus one point three eight behind Al Harfi in the Aston Martin. I think we leave the tires that are on it. He's thinking the longer game. He's thinking about uh, just exactly what is going to be under that car uh, later in what will be a double stint for him. The fluid there will be, I'm sure, the rain yes. from inside the tyres. It's yeah. not That's not come from this Porsche. That's the rain that's been collected, the tyres behind the banding. And and the reason why it's going to take a little while to fix the barrier is because to be a grade one FIA safety circuit, it has to be exactly how it was homologated with that barrier in place as it was. Matteo Cairoli, teammate uh, for the 56. Uh, obviously, firstly, is the driver OK? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was important to, to hear um, PJ on the radio saying that he was all fine. Unfortunately, I mean, uh, it's a bad inconvenient for, for today's qualifying and I'm pretty sure it's going to be tough for tomorrow's, tomorrow's race. So therefore, I just want to wait PJ now and see what's actually happened. But we saw already the same issue two years ago with my old teammate here in the Orouge. So um, unfortunately, it's a really unlucky point for us. And uh, yeah, I mean, we try to get back stronger in Le Mans. Yeah, I mean, you've got the team around you. They've got a lot of work to do tonight, haven't they? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm also very deeply sorry for the team uh, because they, they were working extremely hard this weekend. Car was running well, it was um, all fine, and PJ was actually doing a great lap until that point. So, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's part of racing and we need to accept it. OK, thank you. Yeah, passionate young man, Matteo Caroli, and a very quick man indeed. Let's hope that the Project One guys can get that done. We're going to see this incident. So uh, he, had all just, the way. he had just set the past this last sector. So clearly feeling like he's in the group, but you see the car just go light at the top there, carrying just too much speed. The rear end couldn't take it, and into the barrier you go. It's the margins are so tight between success and disaster, and that's the response you'll get from these guys. Their but first thought will be for the driver, of course, but they've also got the, the job ahead of them. Just check in there, look, give us a thumbs up. Yep. I need to know you're okay. And it's quite hard when you're sitting in the car to actually know if you are okay yeah. in, in that moment because you've just had a massive crash. The shock, like I said, is just running through your body and your body's doing the right thing in dampening the pain out. 
Yeah. So even if you have, you know, like when I broke my back in 2012, and I, I didn't really feel immediately any pain. Well, here's the thing. I was commentating at the point where, where that happened. That was you, your fault, wasn't it? It was my fault. <laughs> uh, it's usually is. You got out the car, and at that moment, you seemed to go, I think I called it. He's out the car under his own steam. Yeah. He looks like he's probably OK. And you absolutely were not. Your body does some incredible things in shock, and uh, I learned that that day. Uh, I just wanted to get out of the car. Uh, yeah. I just, you know, it's like it's that fight or flight mechanism kicks in and yep. you just want to run you want to run away from the problem the, um, the, the most dramatic example that i can remember is mark blundell crashing an indy car on the oval in brazil bang hard into the wall it skated along the wall came to a standstill he'll get out he got out started walking along the oval and then collapsed because he'd broken both legs wow but he could get out of the car and start walking, and then eventually the rest of the body overtook what the adrenaline was, was doing, and he just collapsed on the track. We go, what's wrong with him? Well, it turns out he'd broken both legs. And it's six and a half minutes left of this session. The clock has stopped, of course, yeah. on this red flag. And it will be the remainder of these cars, that, what is it, 12 of the cars to rejoin 21. Clearly not going to be back in the session, neither is 56, for obvious reasons. It's going to be very tough, though, Anthony, because they have to go out, do an entire lap at the circuit before they get to the start line and do a time lap. We've got six minutes 30. It's going to take them nearly three minutes just to start the first lap. So it might be a single lap shot. Let's get down to the pit lane again and catch up with Charlie Eastwood. Louise Beckett, ready to talk to him. Charlie Eastwood, teammate of Ahmed Al Hati, who put in a great run just before that incident. Yeah, amazing. Obviously, we've had some rain this afternoon, so I don't think the track is just where we finished. Obviously, FP3 again was, was wet, so... Yeah, amazing job to just go straight out on a track like this. It can be quite daunting to put the lap in straight away. So it's amazing that he's put in this banker and hopefully that's enough to, to keep pulling. And we don't like seeing incidents like this, obviously, and it's uh, disrupting the session. But uh, here in Spa, at Eau Rouge, is it likely to happen? Yeah, unfortunately it is. It's, it's the best circuit in the world, but it also punishes you because of that. So. Yeah, you see everybody queues at the end of pit lane because really actually making sure that you get that banker in. Again, I don't think the Iron Dames uh, of, of Bovi didn't get a lap in, so that's always the risk if you're not at the end of pit lane. But yeah, again, for Ambin to do an 18-1 on his first push lap is, is incredible. Right, well done. Thank you. Uh, Charlie Eastwood, by the way, on a win double if he uh, for this weekend. Uh, won last week in the overall in a yes. Pro-Am LMP2 car. So not only a win last weekend, but a win in a prototype and back this time to GTE. And if you want to know what, Anna, what Ahmed El Harthy had for breakfast, come and talk to me because he's in our hotel. We were chatting <laughs> to him breakfast. So we know what he's... Uh, but, but that, I mean, it is that thing, isn't it, where, so, I mean, and everybody was talking about it, about maybe it might rain and you've just got to get a lap in before the yellows because we're at Spa and you expect. It's not that it might happen. The chances are much higher that it is likely to happen, especially with more gravel traps around now, because when you're right on the ragged limit in qualifying as you are, where there's even less of no margin for error than there would be normally, if you go off in a lot of places now, you end up stuck in the gravel. Yeah. And so that is an immediate red flag. Um, so, yeah, yeah, for everybody who hasn't got a lap in, and that's Sarah Bovi, then we are waiting to go. Now, the, the Aston Martin at the front of the field there is the other uh, TF nope. Sport Aston. No, that's the, the TF Sport no, no, that's no, that is ORT. No, so behind them again. is the, the other one. They've done yeah. it again. They started at, at the shop in there, the queue. What? The interesting one for me is that Sarah Bovi is not in the, no, the she, lane to leave quite yet. She's yeah. still on the pit apron underneath Now they're pit starting window. the car. So they're giving her space from the start of this, on the restart of this session. But uh, the other question I was going to ask you, Ant, we, we had those couple of laps at, at pace. Is it one or two laps at this point to get those tyres back to the point where they can push? Well, we heard... Well, I heard from the radio message from uh, to Ben Keating saying to start using that extra power or whatever after, they, they, after just one. That was just after one time Correct. lap, wasn't it? So yes. out lap and one time lap, then the tyres seem to be ready. This could be a one shot deal for some of these teams I think it to improve their times. And I that's, think it really that's the be. point. Here comes Sarah Bovi. There'll be a lot of local support for this. There'll be a lot of wider support for this. 
So this have they put her on new tyres? We didn't get to see. We okay. didn't see. I think they might have, but she hadn't set a lap, so it might be that they're going on the same tyre. But, the, but leaving late gives a space in front of her, that space to negotiate, but it takes time off the clock. She might only get one time lap. She might be... They might have back-timed it enough to get two time laps, but the problem is how quick can you go on the outlap? It is dry, but the tyres are oh, stone well, that, that cold. Quick. That's how quick you yeah, can go. Yeah, that's far too quick. This is the apex yep. at uh, the top of the hill, the Com, and you can go straight on there. And uh, yeah, there we go. Pops back into view. Now, that's not like Keki Rosberg accidentally going up an escape road so he gets a much better start to a qualifying lap. That was a genuine error. Uh, yes, indeed. So. What might happen, though, to her, she's a bit too quick on this outlap. So you've got the situation here where Keating's got a car in front. You need, ideally, a little bit of space on this high-speed circuit. Even the GT car is going to be kicking up lots of turbulence, and you don't need that on your qualifying lap. So that will cause a bit of a, a, a snake effect into the final chicane and a bit of a traffic jam that Bovey might just she come might. up against if she goes a bit too quickly on this lap. She's just come out of uh, Turn 11, Puan. The car ahead of her, turn 15 at the moment, that's Claudio Schiavone, so she's got, what, two corners um, of leeway and to Keating, get her foot in. Keating's in an Aston Martin sandwich. Aston Martin were 1-2 in qualifying in GTM here last year. Ben Keating took pole, and it was the northwest AMR of Paul Dallalana who he just beat to pole. He was in an Aston last year run by TF Sport, and currently chasing an Aston run by TF Sport. So, Ben... It's a super slow-mo there over the kerbs. This car has looked better and better through this year. And don't forget that the fastest time we saw in free practice two, i.e. the last dry session, full dry session we had, was actually a, a two minute 15. And way off, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 218 at the moment. Now that was very close to not being a legal turn four there. If you've got all four wheels inside the white line as you crest the bar. Oh, and a big oh, and a big oh, and he's hit the, he's used the big button, hasn't he? Just trying to push yeah. too fast, too soon. The carting equivalent, the hand over the carburetor to choke the engine up down the straight. Here we go with Sarah Bovey, starting a fast lap. And now Harty's going Hartie even faster. You still. See the bottom of your screen there, the purple sector, fastest overall, so i.e. against himself. Oh, that was illegal. Track, wasn't it? So that Completely lap loses that lap. Will be gone. It's pressure here, isn't there, for Sarah Bovey? It's going to be really interesting. Last three minutes of this session for a young lady who has been an absolute star in this effort in both the European Le Mans series and the WEC. But here, right now, this is a lap, this is not this lap, the lap that follows is going to really, really matter. And it was fast as well, so she's going to wave goodbye to this lap with two and a half minutes left yep. of this session. There are several corners where they absolutely will not permit exceeding track limits, and turn four is right at the very top of that list. Confirmed. And it's turn four of 19 corners. Confirmed that lap is deleted. Yeah. Now Harty improves even further on his own lap time in the second sector. Yeah, Keating's lap was deleted as well because he exceeded track limits at turn five. That was going straight on at La Source. Here's uh, the penultimate part of the lap where you can have track limits in Blanchemont. That's very tempting, especially for the GT drivers to run out too wide. Quick. And the last one coming up in the final corner exit, you've got to be careful here as well. Does he keep it within the white line? Yes, yes he does. Quick and clean. Half a second up. This is going to be an impressive. Improvement from Amber Del Harty by 65 hundredths of a second. And look at the gap, that means nobody else is within two seconds now. And he's got another shot. Great lap from Amber Del Harty. The Amarni driver has been making a name for himself in GT3 racing, as I said earlier this year, made a convincing debut at P2. And here in GTE, is he about to put himself on pole position? Well, he's raced here before time. in British GT yes. a couple of times before he stepped up to the international stage. Ryan Harwick keeping it nice and clean there over Radion through uh, up onto the Kemmel Strait. This flat looking section, Anthony, has got an elevation of nearly 45 degrees, it feels, when you're walking up it. It really does. It doesn't feel that much in a car, in a racing car, but um, just looking at these first sectors now. Here's Sarah Bovey, she has just started, so this is a critical lap with 50 seconds to go. This is her last lap she's going to have, well, all of them, all of them matter. Yep. And uh, the first sectors come popping up 
Well, Harty is quicker. Ben Keating in second place is quicker, but fastest of all, Lewis, Lewis Pierce Compank. As things stand after, after the first that sector, clean. that was clean. After the first sector, at the moment, 0. 0.137 up on his own time is Ahmed Al Harty. 0.138 up by one thousandth is. Uh, Lewis Perez she was fastest in the first sector last time around, yep. but that, that was deleted. What's it going to be this time around for Four both teams back. Not enough. She's no way near enough. It's got to be a banker at this stage. It's got to be a banker to pull herself up the order. So here's Compank into turn 12. Not the ideal line. I'd say didn't quite use enough uh, of the track on the turn in there. Might have just scrubbed a bit too much speed off. But Al the Harty, first sector stands. Alharty is three tenths up on his previous best wow. in sector two. Lilu Wadu, who shares that car, obviously, with Compank, watches on nervously. It's gone for Ben Keating, he's not going to improve, and Lewis Perez Compank is eight tenths up, or oh, sorry, off yeah. that base. It wow. is going to be Armand Harty. He lost it in that, so like I said, in turn 12, 13, 14, he wasn't using enough track and didn't carry the speed, but someone that has carried the speed is Al Harty in the Aston Martin. What a great run. And across the line, another quarter of a second quicker. 2.29 seconds quicker. He has absolutely thrashed this field here this afternoon. Two times quicker than last year's well, pole. Well, he's done it by being fault free yeah. and clean and quick. 83, Lewis Perez Compact. That's the best qualifying result for that car. They had a really strong race two weeks ago in Portimao. Sarabovi 1.5 off. But still, that would put her third if she can only be 1.5 behind the line because Ryan Hardwick in 88 third. is third quickest, 2.2 back. Amazing, isn't it? Good Sarah result Bovey last weekend. could be third on the grid with this time. Needs just to be neat. Tidy keeps just on keep the clean. Come on, baby. Whips the horse to the line, and it is second. second. So she beats Ben Keating for the first time this year, but does not get pole. Amazing. But still, almost two seconds off that time from Malhati, a first oh. ever pole position in the FI World Endurance Championship for an Amani driver. Any one of his three quick laps would have been pole, and each one, each successive lap was quicker. Ahmad Alharti, that is fantastic. They'll be dancing in the streets of Muscat tonight. Well, but that AF Corsa car has got speed in it, and that fastest first sector, we can't deny that, we can't ignore it. Uh, and I think Lilu Wadu watching on knows that the car's got... I mean, they set the fastest lap of the weekend so far. Don't forget that AF Corsa car with a 2 minute 15 second lap time. No getting away from it. That was excellent stuff from Armand Alharty. And all of a sudden, he puts his name into the increasing number of drivers in this uh, GTM group that can contest a pole position. Uh, this, this is a, a field guys that it's just getting better and better entertainment you know with it with the end of the gt pro class at the end of that season there was a lot of thought that maybe the bite will have gone out of this not at all <laughs> the storylines here are absolutely brilliant well and the other deal is because it's single class qualifying we're able to focus so much more on the am drivers in this category who are just as, look at the gap here the castle racing takeshi kimura the the japanese battle Eight thousandths between oh. D Station and Car Guys. I mean, eight thousandths. D Station and Car Guy is another of these subplots that just keeps running. I've asked, yeah. is the needle between these two guys, Hashino and Kimura-san, they seem to be together on track or quite yeah. literally almost every time we see them. It's another part of the storyline in GT. Yeah. I mean, it's a fantastic battle between them to be the, the best Japanese crew and uh, D Station coming out there by a whisker, the blink of a human eye. But no. last week we had a Turkish driver winning outright in ELMS and we have pole position for an Amani driver. Again, you know, part of global sports car racing and is bringing in different nationalities that may not have the sort of history that Britain and France Absolutely. and Germany and the USA. And, and don't underestimate for a second as well the mental impact it has for an AM driver. Yeah. Watching something like this, a car going into the barriers and one of the most difficult corners that they'll face this season in the World Endurance Championship. That mental impact it has for an AM driver is very different compared to a pro driver who can just shake it off, get out there, drive flat out again. It's a, it's a different kettle of fish, that one. Michelle Gatting, Rahel Frey, I can see that you're disappointed, but I think that red flag really messed up the flow there. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, but we know it's Spa. We know the risk is, is there. The most important thing is that the driver is okay, and it seemed that he was, but it was a big one. But um, we know the risk was there, and it um, was not the best qualifying session so far. Uh, but again, P2, we, can, uh, we, we should still be happy with that. Yeah, you can take that, can't you? Absolutely. It's a good pace for tomorrow, and tomorrow we keep fighting as usual. All right, thank you. Thank you. So that uh, last flurry uh, in the last uh, flying lap in the last 60 seconds has shuffled PJ Hart down the order. Mm. I think in any case, because he brought out the red flag, he will lose that lap ultimately I anyway. Know. I think I that's the way the rule set I works think now. think so. 56 and the 21 in the Wells. Well, the good news is there are lots of Porsches around. There are very few 488 GTEs because, <laughs> because they keep wrecking them and they're not making any more. You, you say that. I mean, um, no, it's the honest answer. <laughs> that we, we've been short of spares for this. It's one and P2, gentlemen. Yep. And this is where we turn up the wick just a little bit more. Albert Quick, is he going to set pole position here? He set pole position in Long Beach last week, uh, two weeks ago, when we were in Portimao, and he was not in the United Auto Sports car. 11-car field, and, well, last time here at Spa for Alpine with an LMP2 car. When we were here last year, they were in hypercar. This year, they're in LMP2. Next year, they'll be one of our at least three Four, four new coming to at least four new coming. Five, at least five. <laughs> Spanish Inquisition. Alpine. Alpine, I forgot BMW, this morning. Lamborghini is so Yeah. At least. Yes. At least that many and watch new this space. manufacturers, not just additional cars, because there'll be four more new cars for Europe, for the World Endurance Championship rather, from Porsche alone. Uh, so two, yeah. two new cars next year in addition to uh, the new car we'll see later in the uh, in the show in the hypercar class. Proton joining us, we hope, at Monza. So that'll be the two 2023 customer cars for WEC. Two more to come in 24, as well as the new makes you've already mentioned, Martin. Vos Vos. Vos, close to home. Yeah. Uh, almost within stone throwing distance of the uh, circuit. Not that many people at the circuit will be throwing stones at WRT. Doesn't like to be more than arm's length from a waffle at any point, Vincent. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I thought that was Anthony you were referring to there. But uh, LMP2 it was fascinating cars. insight, actually, speaking of Vincent Voss from WRT, the head of WRT, of course, uh, in the uh, full access uh, video that's on YouTube, if you haven't watched it from Portimao, definitely do. do. 35 minutes. I need to do some cleaning and I need to remove some advertising which may hinder the session. I prefer to keep you guys on hold in the pit lane than having to red flag. Good job, Eduardo. Yeah, the right call. Yeah, so speaking of the full accent, Vincent Voss is a bit of a star when the two isn't WRT it, drivers are really at each other <laughs> after their stint. Like, Why didn't you let... You were on the radio saying that I should... You know, that I should get by, and you were holding me up, and I didn't do that for you. And he looks over, just wags his finger at both of them. I think he's kind of, there's a camera there. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> Spoiled yeah. off on Vincent. <laughs> I know. But that, uh, you, you mentioned it. I'll, I'll give it a massive plug. Uh, WC Full Access uh, available on YouTube as the fabulous Unimog goes out for the brushing up. Um, and it really is unrivaled access to the dramas behind the dramas. It's the stories behind it brings that. brings a human element to it racing. It really does. And it's, it's a fabulous uh, job, again, by the WC broadcast team in, uh, in, in, in bringing that, uh, that insight when I know it's a, a gathering uh, popular part of the coverage. I like the flags on that thing. I just, it's a Unimog. Why, why does it need flags? It's a Unimog. So he knows where the edge of it is. Ah, you go. All right, smart. <laughs> <laughs> Let's catch up with the man in the hat. No, not JK of Jamiroquai. VV of WRT. Louise Beckett down with Team WRT, who again will be here next season on home soil with hypercars. Let's catch up with Van Sanvos. looking forward to this weekend your home race of course home race is always uh, something a bit special uh, we have seen uh, the true spa this week already with uh, some damp some wet and some dry sessions now it seems like quality is going to be dry and uh, let's see what we can do here and how have the WRT's been running so far in the sessions so far so good we had two sessions in, in P1 and the uh, second car also was there at the front and uh, the first session we were doing long run and uh, we were preparing our race. We're all still talking about that little bit of uh, <laughs> racing between your two cars in Portimao. Uh, are we going to see some more of that? 
yeah, why not? I mean, we are here to race, and uh, as long as they don't do mistakes, I allow them to, I allow them to race. Thank you. Well, Listen, that whole team, Van Sam Vos raced at Le Mans in three different cars at least. He's raced here, you know, he was he was a racer. The man on the pit wall, Thierry Tassat, multiple winner of the Spa 24 hours, touring car legend. The guy that you very rarely see who I wandered past in the, in the paddock, Kurt Mollikens, yeah. raced in Formula 3000, you know, very nearly made it into, in fact, he and Christian Horner put together a team where they were running two car teams separately and then they ran Pierre each Giudone's other together. Pierre Giudone, yeah, it's, I mean, it's an astonishing collection. Of, if you're a Belgian of legend talent. and you haven't worked for WRT, you're actually not a Belgian so, legend. Something's gone wrong. <laughs> yes. Something's gone wrong. But I mean, look, we saw there the attitude, let them race next year. We know they're bringing the BMW uh, hypercar, the yeah. um, hybrid V8 here. There'll be two cars uh, from that team. I think we can reasonably assume that they're going to be part of the LMGT3 effort next yep. year. What might that bring to this championship? We were talking about motorcycle legends um, earlier in the show. Let's just take a guess of who might be one of those cars, well, shall we? Exactly. One of their SRO racing uh, GT3 BMWs is number 46. And if you're any kind of a motor racing fan, you know what that means. Tom Anthony's Blomqvist. pointing. That doesn't work on the telly. I was trying to grab your attention because that's Tom Blomqvist behind the wheel there uh, of the United Autosport. He missed out in Portimao because he was racing elsewhere as well yes. as uh, Philippe Albuquerque. Was he at the same race as yep. Albuquerque? And um, yeah, so he's back behind the wheel here in Spa. And his dad's here victory. in our hotel. He is indeed. His dad being Tom Blomqvist Sr. So hang on, there's a common otherwise, theme here. So otherwise it, known as Stig. Yeah, yeah of course. So. Everyone that's staying in our hotel seems to be doing really well at the moment. I, so, I, therefore, I'm I mean, look, taking, let's see if it carries on. I'm, it's it's I'm, just all the coaching yeah. they're getting over breakfast. Yeah. I think that's what it is. Because <laughs> Martin's been through yeah. every single possibility of breakfast, <laughs> and he can be, therefore tell them with great experience and knowledge of which is the better one for a I, I think a four hours is an acceptable time to eat breakfast. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. This is the remaining Jota uh, LMP2 car. Remember, we had two of those the first race, the first two races this season, down to just the 28 car uh, this time. Still on hold as the uh, the clear up, as we heard from Eduardo Freitas, is underway. We saw the infamous uh, Dutch driver there coming to the circuit to help there, Hertz van Rental, uh, a little earlier. And uh, securing advertising orders, that presumably is where the impact was for. Uh, the 56 car. I think, yeah, I think they bit, did a bit of a, you know, a quick enough they fix to amend. get, yeah, exactly, to, to bring it up to safety standard. Now they're maybe just going to look, make it look a bit more pretty. One of, one, one of the cars here I'm going to be keen to look at is this car, the number 10 car. Failed to set pole position last time in somewhat controversial circumstances. By how much? One thousandth of a second. And is it Gabby Aubrey aboard the number 10? I'm sure it is. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, so Gabby, Rich vein of form, long time now uh, he's been in these cars and a whole range of teams, including a team that you've raced with yourself. Uh, quiet, unassuming, baby-faced assassin. Yeah, um, I've got a lot of time for, for Gabby. He, he's, a, he's a great driver, um, always fully committed, and, and he, he, really, he really deserved that, uh, that pole position, didn't Did he, he in, in Portimao? He was, he was gutted. I mean, look, for a six-hour endurance race, as it was in Portimao, and it is here in Spa, <laughs> qualifying, you could, you, sometimes it hasn't gone quite, quite gone your way. You can excuse that because, look, so much happens in a world endurance race. I, like I always said, something's going to happen where I'm not going to look back and go, oh, I really wish qualifying went more my way. We had a better result. And uh, but for him, it really hurt. That one thousandth of a really hurt. Completely so hopefully agree. this is redemption day for him. All the 11 cars in the field are out there. Who's out there? In the nine Prima racing car is Ben Viscal. Uh, Gabby Aubrey, as we said, in the 10 Vector Sport car. United Auto Sports field, Philippe Albuquerque in the 22 car. Tom Blomqvist, as we saw in the 23 Jota. It's Pietro Filippaldi in the 28 Jota car. 31 from Team WRT, it's Robin Freins. The 41 from WRT, Louis Delacroix. They are the two that were part of that on-screen drama in the Full Access uh, series. Into your pole competition, we've got Fabio Scherer in the 34. The two Alpine L-team cars, Oli Colwell from the UK in the 35, Charles Malese from France in the 36, and finally, Danny Kvyat, uh, newly named the last time out just two weeks ago as a Lamborghini LMDH factory driver for next year, is aboard the number 63 Prima Racing car. First time in qualifying in an MP2 for Oli Caldwell. So it can be interesting to see how he goes in the 35 Alpine. 
and great that Alpine are joining the field with hypercars next year. I'm sure among the many cars, more than 50 winners, which will be in the parades at Le Mans, uh, will be uh, the yellow, white and black Alpine Renaults that won in the 70s. So they did this in Portimao as well. One lap, back in, change of tyres. I reckon they're scrubbing some, but also you enable the brakes to come up to temperature. That filters through into the wheel. That then filters through into the tyre. Eventually, you get slightly better warm-up, and it saves you from having a tyre that's still got that release agent on it in the race. Yep. So um, the, a gentle scrub of the tyres, get everything else up to temperature, and then you can go and do your lap. So the fastest lap that we've had so far in LMP2, that was uh, practice two, was a two minute six. Right. That's the time we're looking for. Well, and that was set by WRT car 31. Well, the only car that's gone through to start a second front, a full flying lap, is Gabby Aubrey in the number 10 car. We've got uh, just under 12 minutes to go in the session. Uh, Gabby Aubrey on a flyer, as just about everybody else has opted to come in and follow the WRT strategy. And that's a repetition of Portimao as well. It, it was Aubrey setting the pace straight away, and it was those early laps that stayed for so long until the final lap of uh, Delatraz, wasn't it, in the Prema that just pipped him. Oh, yeah. Pole sitters in LMP2 here last year were the Pro-Am 83 AF Corsa team. Wow. Oh, you're right, because they set pole in the first two races. It yeah, was, with um, Perodo Nielsen and Rivera. Bortolotti in the 63. Bortolotti, yeah. 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 And with that Sorry, controversy Bortolotti. at the start of the session where there was a bit of a Stuart inquiry afterwards, but uh, they kept that result. Gabby Aubrey not quite yet up to speed, as you can see, still trying to put uh, some heat into the Goodyear tyres. It is a Goodyear shod class, the LMP2 class here in the World Endurance Championship. As GT3 will be next year as well. I think Michelin have probably enough on their plate supplying what will be a bumper field of getting up for well, over 20, 20 hypercars. 20 or 20 plus for hypercars yeah. next year, which will give us 16 to 18 out of GT3s. It will be a field capped to 38 cars next season again for a whole range of reasons. Vector Sport really have turned things around this season. I think there have been quite a few changes out of the team uh, internally, you know, personnel changes, and uh, I think it's really paying dividends. Let's see what they can do in this session. Apparently, Louise was saying the team were ready for the car to come in just now, but they've decided to stay out there. So all the team okay. were out in the pits, and now they've just gone back into the garage. Is that driver feel? Is that, him, is that him coming out of sector two going, no, no, I, I think it's there, I think, I think it's there. I'll, I'll, I'll try a lap, because they've got the chance to come back in afterwards. It's two seconds off on that first banking lap, if you like, in the first short sector. So it's going to be interesting to see if we can squeeze out of this car in what is a Probably got a flying lap. That's not quick for Pietro Filippoli. Yeah, he's getting some energy into the brakes. Yep. And uh, you can see that as he works his way through Blanchemont. Yeah, so Pietro Fittipaldi, very quick racing driver indeed, in the sole Jota LMP2 car now, because the other car is in hypercar. 204.2 was pole last year Ten in seconds dry off conditions at the moment. Fittipaldi going very slowly through the bus stop, making sure he really fires the car across the line. Waiting for a second sector time from Gabriel to see just what kind of times we're looking at here. Here comes the number 63 car in the hands of Danny Kivia. Red, white and green, the Italian colours marking out the Prema car of our many red and white colour schemes. Still Listen up to this. uphill, uphill, uphill. So yeah, he's straight. not pushing, he's lifted off. He's done a little bit of lift and coast actually before turn five at the Com. So he's still bringing those tyres up to speed as Gabby Aubrey's flying now. Yeah, the fastest time on the board at the moment <laughs> is the same speed as what the GT's just been doing, a 2 minute 14. OK, this is going to be below 2.04 if he keeps it... Well, it won't be if he keeps it up at this rate, but he is going to get there, is he? That's his first proper flying lap. 207 3.15. Yep, so seven seconds quicker that time out. What is left in the tyres for him? He's got a good clear track ahead of him, comes through La Source now with the next car up the road, uh, already through Radion. 
So usually in the LMP2 class, at least, because you've got a car with a lot more downforce than the GTs, you can get those tyres working much faster and you get, they're more peaky, basically, in where their performance lies. So first or second lap. And then there's a much sharper drop-off in performance. So it's all about those, those first two laps. So I don't think they'll be able to do what they did in Portimao, just running round and round, carrying on, uh, getting faster and faster. So uh, I'm expecting a bit of a different set. We can go to Louise in the pit lane. Louise. The number 10 Vector Sport uh, team are ready for him to come back in now with a set of tyres ready for him. He's yeah, thanks, Lou. So that makes sense for what we were just saying about the yeah. tyres being much more peaky. Get him up to speed. Still seven and a half minutes remaining in the session. And the drivers then got a, a much better understanding uh, of, of where the speed is on the lap. Absolutely. Already, by the way, eight and a half tenths up on Gabby Aubrey's best time is Pietro Fittipaldi. Already second, but on uh, course at the moment to break into the 206s this time around. Danny Kivyak goes second for the moment, but will not retain that. Uh, it is a quicker sector time, by the way, from Gabby Aubrey, but only just marginally. To the top goes Fittipaldi. It's a 206. 556 for the 28 Jotaman. What you can do actually, so he's Gabby Aubrey's done the fastest first sector. He's ahead of everybody on track as they circulate, of course. Um, but yeah, he's already down in the second sector. So you can carry on pushing. It's quite often you find you more performance in the first sector, and then you, and then the tires will finally drop away. But you keep pushing just to see how it's performing. You go, nope, they're gone. I'm coming in now, definitely. You go to uh, Robin Frines down at uh, WRT. What's he got to say? Okay, we have a gap. We have a gap. So prepare your lap. Mode five. Mode five. What's going on with Vector? Gabby Orbe was already done. He went out wide there and so lost that lap. I think that was a mistake there. Why he should have been in. On? Yeah. He should have been in. Was that a miscommunication? Yes, because as soon as he was down, you can see that on your dash as well. Against your personal best, he would have seen he was down against the lap he's already done. Five minutes or almost six minutes remaining now. And then he made a, a mess of the final corner anyway. Yeah, three teams, by the way, up on the current provisional pole time. It is Pietro Filipaldi, four thousandths up on his own provisional pole time at the moment. A tenth and a bit. Uh, Tom Blomquist at the moment, quickest out there with a purple sector one. Just about, what, half a tenth. Uh, Bent Fiscal are just now popping up as well. Robin Trine's also on a flyer. So four teams here who are going to improve time by the look of things. Danny Kvyat just off, as behind is Sharma Lacey, under a tenth off yeah. the uh, pole position pace. Kvyat, uh, fastest in sector two of anybody so far. So Pittipaldi does not improve in sector two. It's not going to be an improvement for the current pole position man. Ooh. Sliding all around in turn 19, 20 is Danny Kvyat. What's he going to be as he comes to the line? The two Prema cars. Yeah, behind him, Ben Viscal. Kvyat on top of the pile. Viscal, where does he end up? Well, into the pit lane comes the Jota car of Pietro Filipaldi. I think Vector have blown their chance. I think with Gabby Aubrey not coming in, they're not going to have time to do a tyre change. Let's hear from the team. Next, you're going to have to stay out now. you stay out, so you can cool down and go again if you want, or keep pushing. Yeah, that's pretty clear that that was blown, wasn't it? That was a mistake. I think he should have come in. So, I mean, everybody else changed tyres anyway, so they've been out there on the one set. And they didn't even do the scrub, did they? Blancus so, uh, to the top. Blancus to the top. Ollie Caldwell quicker than that in the 35 Alpine. What about United? They're malingering in the bottom. Well, they were. The 23 car, Philip Albuquerque, 22. Uh, is in seventh place. Tom Blanco is fastest. Is he going quicker again? Blanco is to the top and to the top by a chunk. It's half a second uh, is the advantage here for the number 23 car. Still 1.5 seconds off last year's fastest LMP2 lap. The cars haven't changed. The tyres haven't got worse. Ah, Graham, have the cars changed? I think we've had a slight change uh, for this, this season for them. And remember, that uh, rain earlier in the in the day that might well have taken something out of this track. Oh, definitely, most definitely is. Uh, yeah, but GTs went quicker. Fittipaldi gets out of the Joe's. That's his work done. Looks yeah. immediately at the timing screens, and uh, he'll see that he currently sits in P3. Is that going to be enough? Because Robin Frines has done the fastest sector of all. 
in sector one. Blomqvist yeah. improves as well. Delachaz, Delachaz is up by 24 thousandths on pole currently in the first WRT car and finds up by 68 thousandths. Yeah, three cars under a tenth up on the pole position time in the first sector. So three, uh, one of which is a purple sector time for Robin Frines. Blomqvist Frines, that was the battle for victory in LMP2 in September two years ago at Le Mans. Remember, it came down to the last lap when Yiffy Yee's car broke and WRT ended up winning. The tyres falling away for Blomqvist there in the yeah. second sector. We're hearing that Danny Fiat aborted his lap because the same thing happened to him. So he's doing a cool-down lap with just two and a half minutes Brian's left. The same. Brian's just, yeah, but he is going quicker. The same. Yeah. So both, both those cars yeah. that were up in the first sector, down in the second sector, this, oh. could, this could be done. <laughs> this could be done. Albuquerque, uh, no, that's Blomqvist, clips yeah. the kerbs, slides all wide. Around. And it's not enough, so yeah, back. these tyres falling away by the end of the lap is such a brutal circuit on the tyres that dropping away. But uh, what's Fryan's going to do? No, not enough in the second sector either, as Delachaz drops away as well. Oh, second place for Delachaz. WRT onto the front row with the number 41 car, Louis Delachaz, 3.339 of the second off. Oh, big drift there. <laughs> at uh, point three three nine off the pole position time at the moment. Don't makes, me realize, makes me realise, guys, that tyre wear management's going to be a thing Huge. for LMP2 in the race. Yeah. Huge. They're really going to have to work these tyre, these Goodyear tyres for all their worth to not go over the cliff, uh, particularly on the green circuit for the first couple of stints of the race. That three or four, OK, good work, you're yeah. saving tyres, good work, you're saving fuel. That's the way LMP2 is going to be run. Going to give you a good lap here, tenth and a little bit more off the pole position time, but this could be a, uh, a lap to contest for pole or for the front row. But this is the key sector, sector two, so you've got to get out of turn 14 clean. Good first sector as well from Fabio Scherer in the Inter Europol car yeah. that is currently 10th. He's done a 36.6. Danny Kvyat's done a 36.7. Uh, not enough for Kvyat. Yeah. Enough. How much tyre has Fabio Scherer got left? But that's the other question, isn't it? Is who's been looking after these tyres to this point? Mm. Has it just been not quite on the pace? Has it been looking after the tyres? <laughs> You're right, he's, he is seven tenths off. I really think Vector Sport will be kicking themselves Ooh, after this. If they wanted yeah. pole position today, I really feel like if they'd gone for that second set, when they were all geared up, ready to do it, yep. Uh, they, and they, for some reason, decided to stay out there. I think pole could have been theirs with, with a, a better strategy in terms of tyre management. I think their strategy was right. I just don't think that it got across to Gabby Aubrey Maybe that he, was, he had to come in this lap or they'd run out of time. So miscommunication or no communication, whether or not it was a radio fault or misunderstanding, I'm sure we'll hear post-session. But I think you're absolutely right. That was a chance went a begging, didn't it? Check the flag out now as the session will come to an end for everybody. And I think all these cars are just going to come out and peel into the pit lane, basically. But they will do it at full pace so that the tyre engineers get readings from the tyres and from the brakes and from everything else. And, of course, it will be a full race speed pit stop and driver change as well to rehearse ready for the race. That was an improvement, by the way, from Fabio Scherer, but only up into eighth position, not yeah. contesting for the front rows here. Well, well still grandstand, by the way, as we see... Uh, Robin Fines go up through a uh, Rouge and Radion. Kvyat's sixth lap will be examined, but his best time came on his fifth lap, so that should not be a drama. The problem for everyone here is that the circuit was improving whilst their tyres were degrading. Absolutely. Yes. Whoever put new tyres on closer to the end of the session, I think a lot of teams made a, some mistakes here. So you can see the rubber line going down now through these corners here. And uh, that's, that's where your lap time comes from. See there, the rubber line on, yep. on the racing line? That wasn't there at the start of the session because of the rain earlier on. We start on a completely green track that destroys your tires, and I think they all fell foul of it. Yep. Well, there is the man with the best lap in the session, Tom Blomqvist. He's getting used to that, isn't he? Both uh, here in the World of Joys Championship, but particularly in the IMSA racing, where he's really made a name for himself. And last year racing in ETCR, the Electric Touring Car Championship, he and his teammates were Apache Tombe, who effectively raced each other for the title. Tombe, Apache uh, Tombe, Adrian Tombe, uh, Adrian Tombe ended up with a the title. They, see, now there's a driver that should be in these cars. Oh, yeah.
I mean, hugely overlooked and underrated, and he's he he could just yeah he can do what Blomqvist can do, he can do what Robin Fryens can do. He absolutely should be in a hypercar. Well, there are going to be more and more opportunities for talent to find a place. Yeah. Philippe Albuquerque, uh, just pointing out there, is in no Team man's land. Yeah, teammates to Tom Blomqvist. Oh, he's, he's happy with himself, off. isn't he? Yeah. He's a quick racing driver. Yes, and and United have always had a good car here. Ollie Jarvis, his yeah. teammate, can't hide his smile and the happiness. As well. now, it, Tom didn't get to drive obviously in Sebring because yep. the car broke down, cruelly broke down before he got to the... So this is his first true performance in the car. Yeah. What a way to start. You could see it, couldn't you? As the, as the uh, helmet really came off, glowing from that. And we're going to get to hear exactly how that feels and what he's got to say about it because he's down in the pit lane at the moment with Lewis Beckett. Tom Blomquist getting the pole for 23 United. The team are smiling, you're smiling. That was a great run. Yeah, it was, it was really a good job. Um, you know, I've got to thank the team. Obviously, we didn't have a super clean actually build up to qualifying. Uh, I, wasn't, I was a bit unsure myself actually where we really stood because, uh, you know, I didn't, hadn't really done a really quick lap before. But, you know, the guys trusted me. I know, you know, in a qualifying situation, normally, you know, I, I, I can do all right. So, yeah, I just had to kind of trust my instinct and, and trust my ability there. But, um, yeah, super happy for the boys. You know, they've had a fantastic run. Unfortunate, you know, in Sebring when we had the technical problem. But, obviously, they won last time out. So, yeah, we just got to keep chipping away at it. And, obviously, this is a great place to start tomorrow's race. Well done. Thank you. Congratulations to Tom Blomqvist and United Autosport pole for LMP2. And that is the best place to start any race, Anthony, whatever class you're in, first on the grid or the in GTM or in LMP2, starting think, ahead of your teammates. I just think there's a, a real sign of class from Tom there. He has limited mileage with this team. Like he mentioned, Sebring again, you know, cruelly taken out the race before he had a chance to drive the car. Wasn't in Portimao because he was racing elsewhere. Jumps into the car for the first lazy. time. Proper. Yeah, Didn't you know, drive in Sebring, couldn't be bothered yeah. to turn up to out, you know. Six out of the 11 cars separated by significant, significantly less than a tenth of a second. Brilliant Easy stuff. for it's, you to it, say. You know, you've driven this team before. Here's what you could have won. <laughs> what, the, uh, the hypercar? What a it's beautiful the, thing. It is fabulous, isn't it? This is the brand new Hertz Team Jota number 38. The mighty 38 returns with this Porsche 963. This Hertz Racing Gold liveried Zynga uh, livery design on this car. And it is a stunner, a surefire fan favourite for the moment it leaves the box. And apart from the lights, because the colour is so different and the, and the way the colour is used on the car, totally different looking from the Penske Porsches. That's, yeah. what you you that sort of scallop, yeah. That's what you can do with colour. That's what you can do with colour. And the imagination you see repeatedly from people who know how to design a livery, and it's a really tricky science, isn't it? It's that... It's hello, that, Andy Blackmore. I do, hello, Andy Blackmore. It is that, that, that principle of a car that looks great in a render, great in daylight, and great in a photograph whilst moving. There's the number three car. Where, whereas my design will be throw yellow all over it or lime green. Nothing well, looks bad in lime green. There you go, there's yeah. yellow. There's yellow. But Easy to a... distinguish the two uh, Cadillac cars, and one's completely blue and the other one's <laughs> yellow. Easy. So it Jota, makes it... are you listening? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look, to be fair, they've changed category for us. They did it just So now we us. can finally yep. tell the difference it's, between their two cars. It's the Hertz-backed Porsche 963 or similar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, great to see them uh, in hypercar. Really excited to see what they can do this weekend. Obviously, you know, we've got to monitor our expectations as well as the, the team monitoring theirs because, you know, brand new car is it's, Absolutely. It's going through all the teething troubles. What, what do you want, Martin? Bumped into Sam just after FP3, Sam, Sam Hickman, who, who runs the team. I said, how have you been so far this morning? He said, great, until I, the moment I walked into the garage with the car's owner and it went P1. Oh, not now. <laughs> <laughs> so now his entire weekend is trying to manage down down the expectations. <laughs> if you're on that list, you've bought merch from uh, the Glickenhaus uh, uh, racing crew. That's a great little list. It's carried the, uh, that list proudly throughout uh, the season. I think merch over a particular level. Mirko Bortolotti, Diego Alessi. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a bit of a reshuffle there with Fran Meyer uh, aboard the 708, replacing Ryan Briscoe for this round. And that's part of the team's preparation for Le Mans, where we'll have two sky blue yep. Glickenhouses. But here's what they need to be beating. Toyota, 
laid down the gauntlet with both of their cars, seven and eight. They are, at the moment as it stands, the absolute class of the field in terms of lap times, performance, and, operationally as well. And they should be, because they've been racing that car for now into the third season. These cars only started testing in the middle of last year. And you know, the, 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 the Ferraris, the, the Cadillac, the Porsches are only in their third race, Absolutely. not their third season. 94 Peugeot. If, by the way, you're listening into the broadcast up at Radion in that fabulous new stand, if you hear a roll of thunder as these cars go out, it's probably not the weather, it's probably a Cadillac. 50 50 call, in fairness, could be the weather. They do sound absolutely fabulous. Again, we're seeing, as Anthony pointed out in free practice, lots of cars come to the pit lane and sit and wait. Engines off. In days gone by, you would leave your pit box, and in Formula One, you leave your pit box at the very final moment so you don't bleed heat out of your carefully nurtured heated tyres. We don't have tyre ovens, so there's nowhere to hide in the pit lane when it's cold, and we don't have tyre warmers, so you can sit there all day long because they're not going to get any colder than the ambient. Well, not much colder anyway. Carlos Tavares in the front of shots, Jean Matfigno, and Linda Richards. I want to say it's Linda. She's the CEO of yep. Peugeot. Here we go then. So cold tyres for all, or at least ambient. We I was into anticipating the... Eduardo, but uh... no, we didn't hear him this time. No. Now they're going to be slip sliding the way for this uh, first half, at least, of the lap, and particularly out of the pit lane. The driver's getting all racy, enjoying. Is that a Fred Macko squaring up the Porsche there? Of just course a little it was. full of throttle. He loves a bit of sideways look, action. But look at this. This is slower than the safety car. They are being very very cautious because those tyres are going to take a while to come in. This is what it looks like riding on board with Jean-Eric Verne through a rouge. Not well, flat this lap. Doesn't no. quite break up as much as that when you're in the real car, but it's uh, you get the idea. Yeah, you've got a brand new onboard camera system this weekend and it is actually having a little bit of an issue with eau rouge. Uh, I should say, by the way, the number three car you see they're waiting for, but there's space to go. The drama yesterday in free practice Boy. with a minor fire. Sorry, Sorry, Adam. Graham, just listen to this with McElwee trying to get on power desperately. So here we go into Brussels. He's going to squeeze the throttle halfway through the corner. And I uh, just heard a bit of wheel spin out of turn mm. six at the top of the hill of the comm. <laughs> yes. And he quickly upshifted yes. just to minimize the wheel spin. I mean, this is hard work. The reason why they find it harder to warm their tyres up in the hypercar because they're quicker than the LMP2s, they've got a bit more depth. Sorry, a bit more downforce in the MP2s. So the tyre construction has to be stiffer. Yep. That means harder warm-up. That means more skill needed to get them up to temperature. And this, I mean, it's, it's not easy. You hear all the drivers talking about it amongst each other. Oh, how was it on your outlap? What did you do? Where did you have the wheel spin? Did you have it at the top of the hill? Did you have it in fourth gear? Did you have it in fifth gear? Yeah, it's, it's really tense times. That's one of those things that is slightly evening the playing field for the others against Toyota, because Toyota don't have any more experience of that either. So there's that going. Oh, oh. Toyota. We're about to hear from Will Stevens, but that is the number eight, eight Toyota. Toyota. Just now, as we were saying with the warm up. That's number eight Rouge. Toyota last year. That's the car that stopped with Sebastian Buemi in what? it just after La Source, and they had to abandon the ship and the car was out of the race. That is straight in. That is cold tyres out of the pit lane. He has not been able to warm the tyres up. And that is the exit of La Source. Uh, no, that's the bottom of Eau Rouge. It's bottom of Eau Rouge. That's the, oh, is it? No, it is a, a red line. It is yeah, a red line. It's just the shot looking down made it look like it was low down. And he has done exactly what we saw from PJ Hyatt, but at a much lower speed. It's going to be a very quick turnaround here oh. in terms of rotation of the car. Because look, you can see he's not even pushing. And he's getting on power on the exit. And that's all it took. Look at oh, that. A little tank away. slapper. Tiny tank slapper. And that's all it took. Cold <sighs> tyres. Poor old Brendan Hartley. I mean, it can happen to anybody. Eyes on the stalks. I think we can hear from them. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Guys, I'm in the wall. Damn. I wasn't even pushing. I mean... <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. Ridiculous. Okay. As long as you're okay. Can you reverse? Can you reverse? 
uh, not even push. I mean, not even remotely close to even thinking about pushing, barely even picking up the throttle. I mean, it's almost like he hit a patch of black ice, and that's how little... And, of course, he's coming over the brow, so the car is going extra light, so it doesn't weigh 1,030 kilos plus downforce. It's probably weighing 500 kilos, and then stone-cold tyres, literally nothing going on there. I, I Honestly, after seeing that, I think we're going to have to have a rethink on tyre warmers, tyre blankets. Or well, heaters. you know, one of the conversations in Sebring was how many air freighted in new chassis counteract the fact that we're not carrying tyre warmers around the planet with us? Well, and I, I know people will be saying, oh, yeah, it's up to the driver, the skipper. You could clearly see there. You've got one of the wrong. most skillful he did sports car wrong. drivers in the world there. And he was squeezing the throttle on the exit. It's like driving on ice. Yeah. It, it really is. You've got the grip, you've got the grip, and then suddenly you've got no grip, and you just keep sliding into the barrier. And we saw a crash yesterday, a heavy crash yesterday, one of the cars not competing and qualifying as a result of that. Um, a, a driver driving very slowly through Eau Rouge and the other one, okay, yeah, he didn't respect the white flag, but the reason why the crash happened is because you're having a car driving so slowly up because through. you have up through Eau Rouge, a really dangerous part of the track or, or any racetrack. I don't really like what I'm seeing. The, uh, and you think about Le Mans, they are going to be stone cold pretty much until they get to Arnage. The, the downforce these cars have, like I was just explaining, the downforce they have means the tyres have to be incredibly stiff. They're like blocks of wood when they're cold and they go on the car. And no matter how skillful you are as a driver, Brendan Hartley has just demonstrated to the world, it ain't enough. It ain't enough. Yeah. Uh, did you see anything you did wrong? No. I didn't see a th one single no, thing. No, one thing. I mean, it was <laughs> hardly a snap, was it? And he caught it, and it went the other way. And yep. it's, a, it's the equivalent of a high side on the motorbike. Well, yep. we it, from, it just snaps round. heard from Pierre Alve that because of the, of the, the G-loadings these cars generate, particularly here, he was saying that the left rear car, left rear hypercar tyre generate or, or is subject to at about 1,500 kilos of weight pushing it down in, in the compression at Eau Rouge. The car only weighs 1,000 kilos. So, you know, that's more than half again the car's weight just through one tire. So they have to match that resistance to that downforce with the fact that drivers need to get grip into the tires. And so he said, we're trying to work with the teams to avoid precisely that, to, to try and get the balance of like the cold pressure minimum and the camber minimums so that you can try and build heat into the tyre without it then being destroyed as soon as you, you're up to speed. Well, the other problem as well, there's so much inertia in these hypercars. They're heavy. Yep. As soon as you get a slide, it's not like the old LMP1 days with about 200 kilos lighter than these cars. As soon as you get a slide, it, you can't stop it. It just carries on. That inertia is, is just lives with you. Well, that will mean no time for the number eight car in this qualifying session. And uh, that's going to mean that we're going to have at least one Toyota at the back of this pack. And that's yeah. something we have not seen so far. No. Air temperature is about 15 degrees lower than it was in Portimao. Track temperature is probably a good 20 degrees lower. And, yeah, not ideal. Let's hear from Toyota's Rob Loipen, see what they know. Rob Lopin, you like us are watching on and seeing what Brendan's just done. That that is not what we expect from Brendan or Toyota drivers. So, um, what do you think's happened? Difficult to say. Uh, Brendan uh, reported that he lost the car and uh, that there was quite some damage as he went into the barriers. Uh, we could see that it was say it snapped and then he lost it and went in there. So, I don't know if he touched something which was wet still or something from previous sessions. Uh, we will wait until Brendan is back and then. Uh, we know a bit more. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And Brendan was so surprised about it himself, wasn't it? At, at the end, when he said, uh, you know, he, in, in desperation, he's like, ridiculous, it's ridiculous. Was, I don't was, know why it's. He came, he went on the outside curb, and he came off the outside curb, and then it snapped. But look how slowly he was driving. Did something break? I think he's going to be really confused by that. Did something break? Louise just How told me in my ears done? that Rob is not convinced it was just cold tyres. Look, well, I can stops, see. I could see the tyre. You see the tyre, the, the the right rear tyre as it was. He came through turn three, shuddering, and that's a sign of cold tyres. You see it really flexing and grip slip situation, really flexing around. So that that's a sign of cold tyres. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just here, it's very odd, isn't here, it? Here the air temperature here. Um, 
is 15 degrees lower than it was at Portimao. I mean, yeah, the, there's a good five. reason. There's a good reason why he was going so slowly. Of course, it's because he's yeah. got no grip. So, uh, yeah. Relatively, I mean, look, the the tire barriers are still there. The belting hasn't come off. Relatively low impact, but it's the end of the session for the car. I hope the chassis is OK. You know, it doesn't take much to puncture the chassis from a steering arm getting hit in that direction. And That's yeah. right, my own Roman Dumas at Glickenhaus. Yeah. Uh, there's still, well, by the way, 13 minutes of this session to go where we do get back to green flag running. And actually, two cars hadn't even left the pit, so Sebastian Borde hadn't gone out in the number three Cadillac, nor had Tom Dillman in the number four uh, by Collez. So they hadn't even headed out, well, so just, they've got a we're fraction talking more about, we're life talking in about the caddy when the incident happened, that we're just about to see the number three released. This, by the way, this number three car, or we should say a brand new car yep. here this weekend. Uh, Cadillac uh, embarking on this WC campaign with a single full season car, two cars here at Spa. There will be three with the Action Express racing car uh, making a first appearance for the team at Le Mans. And in between this race and Le Mans, uh, session may resume, we're being told, in about two minutes' time. Car 7, by the, by the way, has been told to stay off the kerbs through Eau Rouge. Okay. They feel like perhaps that was a contributing factor to the fact that he had no grip. Yep. So just as a warning, as a precaution, don't go anywhere near the kerbs as you go up through Eau Rouge on that first lap. Uh, the Cadillac, by the way, between the two races, between this race and Le Mans, will have their first European test uh, down in Portimao with a single car and all six of the Cadillac racing drivers. Also worth mentioning, by the way, in the Cadillac racing pits and watching on, key members of Action Express looking on and learning. Because here's the other thing that we often forget, that's such an important part of success or failure here. It's not just pace. It's not just consistency. It's not just the drivers not making mistakes. It's the team on pit road not making mistakes. It's those tiny differences in regulation between what these ladies and gents, because there's an awful lot of female team members now on this uh, on this pit lane, what their experience in other series is not necessarily the rule set here, and that can cost big penalties in uh, very in very important races. And the one they absolutely don't want it to happen in is the Le Mans 24 hours. Exactly right. Well, we're getting ready to go back to green. If you are watching this somewhere at home or sneakily on your computer at work, it's all right, we won't tell you. It's Friday anyway. It's not like anybody's doing anything much. Don't forget, there are still tickets available for we're Saturday and race now. day. Pit exit is now open. Session has been resumed. The one thing you won't get here at the track is being able to listen to Eduardo Freitas. The one thing you will get if you buy a ticket and come to Spa tomorrow, is full access to the grid walk and the pit, the pit walk rather before, and the driver's autograph session before the cars go out to the grid, and also the six hours of Spa Francorchamps and a chance to see hypercars in the flesh with these fabulous machines. And I have to say, if the race is dry or wet, they are impressive to watch. Yeah, we spent some time, didn't we, up at uh, Radion yesterday, and great to see and hear these cars went up to speed. Do look pretty well nailed, but pretty clearly, Brendan Hartley had a very much different experience. So, obviously, different tyre compounds as well at play in uh, Hypercar. That's not the case in LMP2. Um, we're hearing that uh, a few teams are actually out there on the soft tyres. Uh, Cadillac and Peugeot being two of those teams whilst Ferrari and I think a few others on the medium type, probably Toyota as well, and that wouldn't have uh, helped poor old Brendan Hart. Oh, and that almost was a carbon copy, pretty much what Brendan suffered with on the Cadillac with Earl Bamba. Now he's on the soft tyre. And you could see literally the instant oh. he's flexed his toe on the throttle pedal because there was that little <laughs> snap. And you know, it looks more, you were saying at lunchtime, yeah, it looks more dramatic from the outside as a drive you barely notice. Yeah, I bet you do. Well, no, that's, so that's the speed that you <laughs> carry up. When, when you're up to racing speed and you go through a rigid, you look at it from the outside and you think, was I really doing that? Is it that quick? Inside the car, somehow it doesn't seem that fast. Yeah, it's it, probably why they're pushing the limits so much. Except you're also that. saying, in F1, it's just a hindrance to your straight it line, is. whereas for a sports car race, it's fully keyed up. Oh, my God, it's so rouge again, this lap. Oh, in the F1, you had, remember the, the f up days? Yeah, when yeah. you're going up literally one-handed through a rouge flat out. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's really... 
it really does become that that uh, corner is cracked up to be in a, in a sports car. They just, you know, they have less grip, and you arrive at pretty much the same speed. It's down the hill, and these cars are very quick in a straight line. Look, 250, 260 kph, and we're not even on a on a flat out lap yet as we head towards this final chicane. Yeah, Miguel Molina in the number 50 car, and uh, no doubt whatsoever that the arrival of these Ferrari 499Ps, the first factory entered top class sports prototypes uh, in 50 years have been a major draw but let's listen what's going on aboard the number three Cadillac with Sebastian Bourdais looks like we have a uh, the left rear pressure sensor is incorrect Seb so disregard it yeah so you have a warning inside the car you can see your tire pressures and Bourdais would have looked at that maybe even asked the question why what's going on my left rear uh, that's a concern and they're saying well it's a sensor issue so uh, ignore that great to see his racing father by the way on the autograph session i think he was looking for autographs i saw uh, patrick Bourdais yeah. racing in a panos gt1 in the lmp1 class at sebring in 2003. yeah, yeah father and son not the first won't be the last in fact uh horse felbermeyer's grandson was racing in the Porsche Carrera Cup Benelux and Porsche Carrera Cup Deutschland races here. Sure it won't be long before he's in World Endurance Championship racing. Fred Mako just kicking up a little bit of dust. Now these are the important laps just to get a banker in. You know uh, it's going to be you know the, the, the times are going to keep tumbling like we saw in, in LMP2. Uh, once the driver can start leaning on the car a little bit more in the high-speed corners as Verne approaches one of those corners. That's down at Pruon on turn 10 and 11. You can hear what's going on at Ferrari. Car 51, Antonio Giovinazzi. Hey, mate, so you need about five more degrees on the front. The rears are already starting to be into the window. And that's usually the case, obviously, the rears. You've got that uh, right pedal to do the, a lot of the work for you, put a bit of energy through the rear tyres, but getting the front up temperature is more of a challenge. Oh, See there, edgy, how edgy, edgy. Wiki really edging his way around uh, Blanchemont. Not lifting and coasting exactly, but oh boy. Right, here we go then. So prepare that final corner, get the car nice and straight, maximise your traction, head down towards La Source, both, turn one. Both Peugeot's looking racy, fast first sector from jean Eric Verne, quicker second sector by four seconds from Gustavo Menezes. Yeah, and they're, they're seeing here, Gustavo trying to give himself some space in the 94 Peugeot. First uh, lap time posted, by the way, Fred Makovicki, 2.11.149 yeah. is the marker, but that is gonna come down much, much further. Glickenhaus last year, hyperclass, a hypercar pole, 2.02.7. Oh, oh, spin for the 51. Exit of the source. Oh, 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 no, oh, and I think oh. he's just getting onto the racing line. Yes, he is. So and hard to see. And now it's the second Peugeot, so that lap will be ruined. And for the Cadillac, because there are yellow flags, you can't improve in that sector. And that takes you all the way to, to uh, the top of the hill at Le Combe. What happened here then? Turning looks OK, good rotation, a bit too much rotation, and yeah. uh, getting on power, that was, the rear's had enough. That was yeah. into the apex, he wasn't even on the power wasn't there. Really, well, he's just starting to pick it up, and but yeah, it, it, it's, the car was already over-rotated, like you say, before. It's still there at turn one, X, by the yeah. way, yeah. and uh, it's ruining everybody's lap now, full course yellow. No, not uh, yet. It'll be a local yellow, but it means that anybody who was ahead of him will get a lap. Anybody who was behind him won't because they can't improve or set a quick sector in sector one. So here is one of those drivers that was luckily ahead of him on track is Fred Makowiki, number five Porsche. Heads around turn 15. Paul Frere. Yeah, he's got away now. He's back on track, so those yellow flags have been cleared. And look at the lap time, well, the, the sector times at least really starting to tumble now. Three and a half seconds up is Makowiki on his own best time. And he and Molina were the only cars that got cleanly past the 51 car. Because don't forget, the Ferraris are nose to tail. Watch Molina's time here. Molina way, way up. Eight seconds to the good on the current provisional pole time. So Fred Makovic is going to go quicker and buy a chunk. 2.11.149. But look at Molina in the background. But watch that. 2.26. 2.26 becomes two minutes wow. dead. 0.836. 5.8 eight seconds to the good a great lap there for Miguel Molina 1.9 seconds quicker than hypercar pole last year 
Ferrari on provisional pole, six minutes to go. Who's got an answer to that? Kevin Estra goes second, so it's uh, Ferrari. Papojo goes second. It's Gustavo Menezes go, goes second and third at the moment. Yeah, Gustavo Menezes can't be second and third, but John Eric Van is. Yeah, behaviour under yellow flags will be examined. That might possibly affect jean eric Van, who is the first of the Peugeots to go by. Not sure what he could do there. No, no, I totally agree, Grant. Uh, he, completely he, he was looking at the marshals to see what can I do. He could see the yellow flag, of course, yeah. but you've got no idea in the car. You need help from the marshals, whether to stay where you are or whether to go, or even from your team as well. well They've got the GPS. They may look at whether he slowed down more on the yellow flag lap into La Source than he did on the previous lap. Fair point. And consider whether he slowed down at all before he saw the car in the road. Oh, sorry, I thought yellow flag behaviour was for the Ferrari, the stricken Ferrari that was trying I to get going. I think it was for the cars okay. under yellow flag. So those Peugeot laps, they may need to do again. Right. Up on Molina. his previous time, Molina by three and a half tenth. Also up, also up on the uh, previous pole time, Earl Bamba in sector one in the number three. The problem for the Molina, though, is he's starting to pick up turbulence from the oh. car wheel, and that's exactly why he goes wide in 15. Big moment there. Kept well, it on the island, though. Don't forget, he was five seconds quicker than the Porsche yeah. on the last lap, so he actually should be past him by now. By the way, picked up time, and that was a purple middle sector. He needs to back out here. He, he needs can't. To back Cow. This is the fastest lap we've ever seen from a hypercar here. But he's, I mean, look, he's, oh yes, it, it, he's it's ruined still, the next lap, though. But it's still going to be quicker. But that's the lap that counts. The next lap's the lap that counts. Everyone's going to be getting faster yeah. and faster. He's not going to go faster on the next lap. No. He doesn't go faster on this one either. Still two minutes, point eight three six. Three seconds to the good for Gustavo Menezes. A further, what is that? Half a tenth up on Fred Mikevicki, third uh, quickest. jean Eric Verne currently fourth. Kevin Estra, Tom Dillman, Olivier Pl I'm looking, where is the other uh, Toyota here? And the answer is absolutely nowhere. 11th quickest at the moment for Kamil Kobayashi, but he is, uh, he is up on the current pole time on his current lap. Earl Bamba on a flyer in the number two caddy. Purple sector one. This is going to change very, very quickly. Yeah. Here comes the number two. Ninth to second, boom. Kevin so, Estra third, head of Verne, and that pushes Tom Dillman down to seventh. So Will Stevens now. up to fourth in the Jota. Molina, who on proposition at the moment and currently sits on the pole, has finally backed out of that lap and given the gap to the Porsche in front. Cadillacs go second and third now with Sebastian Bourdais coming through. Three minutes to go, he's Pla third quickest. Pla just up to fifth, pushes Will Stevens down to sixth. Stevens was fourth when he crossed the line 30 seconds ago. Here comes Kobayashi, though. He's on a, a flyer here as he heads down towards that final chicane. Let's see how he navigates his way through the right. Looks good there, into the left, car nicely poised, gets and the car nice and straight there on the exit, keeps within track limits. And he's got a lot of clear air in front of him. The next car it's in pole. front of him it's is it's halfway up the Kemmel Street. Provisional pole for yeah. Camus Kobayashi, Miguel Molina uh, goes down enough. to second, and Tony Giovinazzi goes up to third. See that? If Molina hadn't been held up by the Porsche, that was not enough from Kobayashi. Well. No, the, the main reason why he lost that time is he went off in turn 15. He had a, he had a he was Colin McRae moment know, through the but, grapple. But he, <laughs> but he still closed up on the Porsche and get held up in the bus stop by the Porsche. That's why he needed to back out of it. Yeah. Which he has finally done this lap. So now it's all about the next lap. Two minutes to go. Two minutes to go. It is Toyota, Ferrari, Ferrari, Cadillac, Cadillac, Porsche. Yeah. Bordet within a quarter of a second. This is... Oh, doesn't that sound so different to everything else? Sebastian Bourdais was 1.3 off. He's 2400s off in the first sector. And it's a better personal lap, better personal lap from Will Stevens. This is a great, a great couple of laps. I'm telling you, Vinazzi, six thousandths off. It's a, it's yeah. a purple middle sector. Here comes Bamba. Bamba. He's just what, under two tenths off pole position. A, a good oh. third sector here. <laughs> nice. What can the Cadillac do here? Under two tenths off pole position pace as he cleared sector two. He's going to come across the line now. What can he do? From fourth, he goes. Stays fourth with an improvement. Closes the gap to under a quarter of a second. Will Still Stevens. a minute, 20 seconds to go. Will Stevens. P7 at the moment. Seventh, yeah. Improved, but not enough to improve, if you know what I mean. Here comes the other Cadillac, number three. Shouldn't that be yellow and blue like his helmet? So, still Toyota, Ferrari, Ferrari, Cadillac, Cadillac. Then the first of the Porsches, the Penske car. 
the Hertz Team Jota car on its debut ahead of the second factory run car. Oh, Molina's so pitted. Yeah, Molina's yeah. pitted. It's all over Martin. for Ferrari. Giovinazzi's not going to get it. And the problem for Giovinazzi is he did his personal best lap. He could see Kobayashi disappearing in front of him up the road. No, oh, what? He goes to pole. 35 thousandths. Where did that he go goes from to pole. in the final Two sector? minutes, point triple seven, 35 thousandths up. It was all it in is, the last sector. It is Ferrari from Toyota, from Ferrari. The top three cars separated by under a tenth of a second. And the, and the, and the Toyota and the number 50 Ferrari are both in the pits. They thought it was all over. So did I. Some people are on the pitch. Sebastian Bourdais, he's on a quick lap, but not quite on pole pace. But it's an improvement on where he was before to jump ahead, perhaps, of his teammate Earl Bamber. We're getting a taste right here, right now, of what could be to come for many years into the future in the hypercar class. I'm that not excited at all about hyperpole at Le Mans. Oh, no. you? Kobe oh, no. Ashi, it's, a, it's a proper Gabby Aubrey moment from Portimao. He'd be thinking that was enough. That was a good lap. Just... If, if you're a cat in the back of the Toyota garage, run now before you get kicked. But the fastest first sector and last sector of this qualifying session was held by Miguel Molina yeah, in the I 50 think, front. I, I think he blew it. I, I think, think he, he blew it. I, yeah. Pole was there. It looked like it was there. He was too close to the number five Porsche. Yep. Yep. And that gave him some dirty air through turn 50. Sp ran off the track and then for some reason, decided to pit afterwards. Sparking off the kerb, Sebastian Bourdais not quite on pole pace here as a second down as the oh, host team. Joe Degardi bells it. on that. All right, they, the Cadillacs will well, be fourth and fifth on the grid, but it is Ferrari who take their second pole of the season. The 50 car took pole in Sebring, and it's 51 who takes pole here. And that... Oh, hang on a minute. Was this on his fastest lap? No, All that was the, of, No? Was, there wasn't that the Molina lap. That was That's the Molina the car moment. behind the Porsche, I think. Beyond the Toto. Yeah. Um, well... I hope you're right. Real drama. Antonio Giovinazzi in his third race in the factory Ferrari 499P. The number 51 car sets a second pole position for Ferrari on their return to top-class sports prototype racing after 50 years. So with James Collado and Alessandro Pierguidi, the three-time GTE Pro World Champions, Antonio Giovinazzi, he was a bit of a hero with a car that only had three brakes at the end of the race in Portimao. Uh, he's a bit of a hero here in qualifying he as well. Indeed, yeah, that Portimao drive was sensational, yeah. managing all those problems. And uh, I mean, they came from nowhere because he didn't, he hasn't done a, a purple sector, sector yeah. anywhere. No. It just slowly chipped away at his personal best. And I think it was that final sector where it was just good enough. Yeah. Amazing. Well, really lucky. came under the radar there. Copy where we are, please. You're P1, man. You're P1. 35,000. Oh, yes, man. Second. Yes. You're the Thank man, you. buddy. I'm sorry for the mistake and so on. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, Where are we? P1. Yeah, but he didn't. He didn't know. We he didn't, didn't know. see it coming. No. That final sector was clean as a whistle and super fast, well, and I, that's where he did it. Well, James Collado down in the 51 garage. There he is, looking pretty happy with life right now. But Louise Beckett will put a stop to that. Well, James Collado, huge congratulations. That was a great run. The Ferraris have been looking so strong and fast here all weekend so far. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first two races for us have been really unlucky and it was a, a struggle and we, we needed to knuckle down a little bit as a team on our side, especially, and try and find uh, a way to improve. Um, we've been working really hard since the last race, uh, uh, you know, all of us as drivers and, and engineers. And uh, I think... Uh, Antonio's lap was pretty special, uh, especially as he made a mistake in the first one, tyres not quite up to temperature. But uh, it's nice to get you know, first pole position as on, on our side and second one as a team, of course. And um, you know, tomorrow is a whole different story, but I think this time we're a little bit closer to Toyota. Another pole for Ferrari. Well done. Thank you very much, guys. Could have been a one-two. Oh, could have been a one-two. I been a one still two. think, just looking at the, the potential ideal lap there from the fastest sectors of the cars that set purple sectors, which were Miguel Molina in sector one and sector three, and Earl Bamber in sector two, four-tenths more available there yeah. on an ideal lap. And that is the emotion at Toyota. Not a lot of emotion there at Toyota. They have to give it to Ferrari. That Rufo, was, uh, I think, that called everyone out. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Even Great then. stuff.
And we know after Sebring, when they were surprised at how good Ferrari's qualifying lap was to take pole position, they admitted in Portimao, we've spent a lot more time getting ready for qualifying than we did in Sebring because we were really surprised by that. And I don't think that they underperformed here in qualifying. I just think Molina, uh, Giovinazzi rather found something very special. But Molina's lap, where he was held up at the end of it and got in the Porsche's dirty air, that could have been easier if Ferrari won too. They were six thousandths off, two seconds quicker than pole from last year. And this is in a brand new car. You're right. I mean, what it does is it lights the fire under hyperpole for Le Mans in just what is it? Oh, not many days at all. Well, the, the first thing with hyperpole is when we're in Q2, only six hypercars will go through. Now, last year, that was pretty much we knew who the six were going to be. This year... Oh, uh, not anymore. Not anymore, because what we don't know is how these cars are going to behave on what is a very different circuit indeed. Remember, when they're doing the sums about what they're building into these hypercars, they've got all sorts of things in mind. They've got World Championships in mind. They've got IMSA Championship in mind. They've all got Le Mans in mind. They all want something that's going to produce its maximum possible performance at one circuit, and that circuit is very different. We know nothing at this point about what the form book's going to show exactly. us. Exactly. Exactly right. Well, what we know is that, as ever, standing still only is fast rewind. You have got to keep pushing on, and Toyota will continue to do that. So it is 2-1 to Ferrari on pole positions over Toyota so far this season. <laughs> Qualifying in dry conditions, but on a relatively green track after overnight and lunchtime rain for race three of the FIA World Endurance Championship. First up, GTE Am, the bronze drivers getting a chance to shine before LMP2 and Hypercar take to the track in front of packed grandstands. PJ Hyatt setting a quick time in the Project One Porsche before an even quicker first sector spill disaster. A red flag as he hit the barriers heavily. He's OK. Car is not. Third fastest in the GTE Am field, the 88 Proton Porsche. Second fastest, Sara Bovi in the 85 Iron Dames car. But on top of the pile, it was Aston Martin on pole last year with Ben Keating. It's Aston Martin on pole this year with Omani driver Ahmad al Harti. Into LMP2 and the battle of the Titans. WRT versus Prema versus Alpine versus United versus the rest of the field. And again, evenly matched cars. Prema in with a shot at pole position. Everybody having to be cautious to make sure they control things well in the vast sweeps of Eau Rouge. But the man who came up on top of the pile, Tom Blomqvist, with a stunning lap to put the United car number 23 on pole. With an ever-increasing hypercar field, two new additions this time, a second Cadillac and a brand new customer car, the first customer car run by the Jota team. The first drama, though, was for Toyota. Car number eight, Brendan Hartley on the outlap, snapping sideways, not heavily into the barriers, but enough to bring out the red flags and put him out of qualifying. After clear-up operations, Ferrari were in the mix. The 50 car had plenty of speed, but was held up behind a Porsche. They ended up third fastest. Kamui Kobayashi thought he had pole for Toyota until the dying session where the 51 car of Antonio Giovinazzi came across the line first. But he has lost that lap for track limits, and he will finish with the... There he is, going off. He will finish with Kamu Kobayashi on pole for Toyota. Ferrari starting second and third. So pole short-lived for Antonio Giovinazzi. Exceeding track limits means he has lost his best lap. Well, that was what we we're being shown. That's the reaction at Toyota. Oh, oh apparently how up and down they, was that. Yeah, oh, we they can a show emotion we when they're day after all. When they're handed oh, yeah. pole position back. <laughs> but that was track limits, and, yes. and uh, I will bow, my, I doff my cap to Anthony Davidson and call that completely correctly. 
I now retire from motorsport. <laughs> well, you know what the real problem is? Too many white, red, and black cars. Completely correct. It, I should. It's an instant penalty in my books. Yeah. Instant penalty for Toyota. So and confirmation Porsche. then that that fastest lap of the session was lost, and so pole is a two minute. 0.812, not a two minute 0.777. And Ferrari will start second and third behind the number seven Toyota. But it is the number eight Toyota that is the question mark, the 13th car in the field after qualifying. And hopefully there will not be too much major damage. Last year's pole sitters click in house uh, only. Uh, what did they set? They set a uh, two minute 2.9. So in fact, just two tenths slower than they were last year. Uh, but that shows how much the field has moved on. Let's catch up then with our current new pole sitter and team principal, Kamui Kobayashi. Kamui Kobayashi, well, that's a turnaround, isn't it? The Toyota 7 now pole after that Ferrari lap was uh, not allowed. Yeah, I mean, the first ball, I think, you know, I was surprised because I saw it was second, but lap related make me the pole position, which I felt really happy. The car felt pretty good, but I couldn't improve my second lap, so I just boxed. So as I think, uh, I would say really lucky to have the lap related, but uh, it's good to start tomorrow like this. The, however, I think I ate, it was very difficult, you know, when cold tired to living from here. So. As a team, it's not perfect, but uh, for the driver, it's really tough to be starting cold tire. So I think tomorrow we have a many situation like this with cold tire. So we are fighting for endurance. I had a good celebration today, but uh, we focus for tomorrow. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Uh, the what is it? The top six cars in that session beating last year's pole time. Giovinazzi. That would have been a, a, a horrible moment. Uh, it's, it's cruel to take it away. Yes. I mean, look, you've got to stay within track limits. Every driver knows that. They are the rules. But as any racing driver watching on knows, there was no lap time advantage in that. I think the moral victors of pole position today were the Ferraris. But uh, operationally, it didn't work out for them yet again. Well, don't forget, we'll be back with our race coverage tomorrow afternoon. We'll be on air at 12.15 Central European Summertime. We'll see you then.